This is The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. I'm writer-collector Ryan Condal. And I'm writer-collector Dave Mandel. Hey, Ryan. Good morning. How are you? Hey, Dave. Uh, we are saving daylight. Happy Daylight Savings Day. I am in a blur. Uh, I, I Last night was sitting at my desk working, and at 1.59, it changed till 3 a.m., and I went, oh, fuck. And so I am... Uh, more bleary-eyed than usual on this fine, uh, fine late morning, early afternoon. Well, you seem very whatever potent it is. Yeah, to me. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. the um, illusion, of, as my yeah. teachers often thought. So yes, yes, exactly, and my employers. So yes, thank you. I'm yes. glad. Yes, and, in some ways, you you're saw... my employer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish. I, I wish. Oh, that'd be great. We oh, pay each was... other a dollar. Oh, like if that, this was like our a... gig, Dave. Yeah. Oh, how, the podcasting we would do. Um. I uh, and I, I saw you uh, very bleary eyed uh, this week in the flesh. We yes, can, we can post it was very fun evi- we, uh, evidence proof on the uh, social got feed. To see you, you, uh, you did that kind of stuff that I'm not even sure I could do anymore. Which is, you basically flew here for two days. It seemed like, uh, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, like I get like New York, London, but like London, LA is nuts. But uh, it was actually really fun. It was great to. Uh, to have dinner, as they say. So, yes, yeah, I was really. Yes, enjoyable. we had a, we had a yeah. great time, and yeah. I, I managed to like sort of. I had I had essentially three days on the ground there, not really, but like three days on the you know without sleep. I guess if you the add ground. the top of the first day and the yeah. bottom of the yes. the last day, it equals a it third was like day. smushed yeah. together yeah. three yeah. days. So I'm basically like, all right, guys, I have I have I have I have one dinner. <laughs> to offer and i have three lunches because we i was in for a pre emmys event for uh for house of the dragon and uh, we hosted uh, uh, a an event for the tv academy where we screened an episode ha- held a q a uh, it was all over online so some people anybody that's following the show has probably seen it josh gad moderated which was great fun i didn't even uh, ask you which episode did fan. you end up sh- did you decide did you guys show i don't think i knew which one uh episode eight. Oh, episode cool. eight yep. um yes which is uh you know viserys at his at his uh, at his uh, Emmy winningest, I would say, um, yeah, it was it was great. It was great fun, and and uh, jo- Josh Gad narrated uh, most of the big cast came in, with the exception of just a couple of people uh, scheduling conflicts and things like that. And uh, yeah, it was good fun. But I, outside of that, I just I you know my my brother is is in L.A. and a bunch of friends. So I was like, all right, you know, lunch. And, uh, you know, this well, day I was got willing a... to take a lunch or a breakfast, but I was thrilled to get a dinner. So you got the you. dinner. Yeah. And uh, I got to see I got to see agents <laughs> and and uh, and all that. I got to, uh, you know, I got you to, really um... should have had dinner with your agents. That would have been really a good use of your time. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, they they desperately I made it. I made them come to my hotel for breakfast. That's so exactly that was, right. That is correct. That, that was the deal there. Yeah. But uh, but uh, and I think we'll probably talk about this in a future episode because we've got lots to talk about tonight. But I actually I got to see the Academy Museum while I was in. So we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned because I think we'll, you know, we'll probably talk about that in the, in the coming weeks as I kind of process through it. But it, I was thrilled to be there finally because, you know, after, I don't know, when we became charter members in 2018 I know, or exactly, whatever yeah. it was. that It that was like for the longest time, time, it seemed like they were, it was taking forever for them to build the museum. And then they did their side of the bargain. And then it took you and me forever to actually go to the museum. And that right. was not their fault. Right. Yes. Right. That was I mean, a, yeah. a, a, you know, once in a generation plague did, did, uh, you know, throw a wrench into the works. Um, but, yeah, uh, but it was, it was, who are you kidding, Ryan? There are going to be plagues there's this is like the first of many but anyway first let's keep going Excellent. yeah yeah, yeah exactly. bring it on <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but the museums uh, will always be there plagues or not so that's, that's right good news. yeah that's <laughs> right so it was uh that was that was a that was a delight got to see uh our names up on the wall uh, uh you and i are both neighbors there with our good friend kelvin mao who also uh joined joined me for the adventure at the museum so it was uh you know it was all in all a very densely packed trip but really fun and and just good and restorative i mean i just i miss my people in la uh present company included um and um it was uh, it was just though brief it was very nice but i will say i guess as a little bit of a i guess i don't know a warning a little bit of something that if this episode seems off it's because ryan and i saw each other in person and were able to actually talk as human beings as opposed to right. what we normally do which is save it up for this and we've actually right. we've actually spoken as opposed to right. this, where normally it's like, blah, 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 but it's like, no, no, I told you, I told you on Monday. So yeah, so 
Yeah, forgive we us. got through forgive that. Us. We got yeah. through that already. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, and also, <laughs> also before we move on to uh, to uh, movie business and prop business and all that, uh, very very big congratulations to Bartley Taylor, our wonderful uh, producer and editor who got married this weekend. Yeah. Um, I have no idea when this episode is going to air, but he got <laughs> married. Right. Got married. He's the... been married for three years by the time this airs. Yeah. But yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. But we're very proud. Very very proud of uh, of, of of Bart and uh, and uh, congratulations uh, to to him and uh, to, uh, Jared, his lovely husband. So, uh, really, really good on you guys. And, uh, uh, very, I was very sorry to miss it. I just show stuff that got, you know, horribly in the way. And, uh, but it's, it's really awesome and, uh, good on you guys. So there you go. And hearty stuff dreams are made of congratulations. Yes. And they are registered at propstore.com <laughs> under um... Ryan 10. <laughs> <laughs> Covering all the bases uh, there. What's new in props? What's new in props? I got something uh, new in props. I uh, want to cool. show what's something. You, I got yeah, something. I'll you, go quick. Do, yeah. Do this you, is not. Uh, you... This is not a radical. What's new in props? This is a minor. What's new in props? Which is, I got one of these things. Because I'm showing that. There you go. Which is a, ah. Look at that. Yes. Which is uh, auction catalog. It's auction catalog. It's heritage teaming up now with Screen Bid to do HBO's Watchmen. Um. And I was sort of fascinated by this because I guess there had been, I don't know, I guess there was another screen bid auction or two, but I guess this was the first one I'm paying attention to um, in conjunction with Heritage. And it's a gorgeous catalog of the Watchmen, which obviously fits a little bit more into sort of, uh, what's the word, our area of stuff we like, both in terms of uh, the the TV, movie, comic book um yeah. Venn diagram. So this, you know, there's some very cool stuff here, but uh, it was nice to see just a really well done catalog that really, it's a, it's a silly thing to say, a catalog that actually catalogs a show and really identified, you know, episodes and what things are from and where and whatnot. And again, I'm not a expert on the Watchmen show. I watched it. I enjoyed the heck out of it, but uh, it was very cool to see. And I just, uh, I, I just sort of more of a, more of a what's new shout out. I don't think there's anything I'm rushing to bid on, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, have you looked at the catalog or seen it? Yeah, I, I flipped through it because I was sort of fascinated by it. I also really, really liked, uh, really liked the show. And um, uh, we're actually working with uh, one of the directors from, from oh, Watchmen okay. who came, Great. who came highly recommended by not only HBO, but also by, uh, by Damon Lindelof. So, so we took that, you know, we took that uh, aboard uh, <laughs> with, 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 uh, great seriousness uh because that was a great recommendations and he's been terrific so far so excited to to be working with him but uh yeah i really love the show and actually it was funny because it was one of those shows that i think i started and then it was one of those ones that like it it wasn't really up my wife's street so it was hard to like why we try to find things to watch together and we actually sure. do watch a lot of things together that do fold over into both of our interest worlds but things like and or things like the mandalorian those She's kind less, of fall outside, yeah. less, less excited about so that, and this was one of them. And well, I actually loves, went back to, she loves racism. She loves racism. So that was, she, uh, that's actually the true. Yeah. yeah. Right. Big into that you know, collector and, and so on and so <laughs> forth. And, uh, and, uh, and we, um, so I, but I went back to revisit that show uh, in for professional research sure. and I had forgotten how damn good it was yeah and i think actually ironically i watched the episode where we had left off so it got me sucked right back into it oh, that's i've been good. watching it and i was that's watching it on the yeah. plane and like i'm like i'm like telling everybody i'm getting off the plane you gotta check out the show watchman it's you it's, just sound you know, like an old old man yeah <laughs> it's really I, I will say the catalog yeah. did the make sopranos me, right. really <laughs> the catalog show. made me think about re-watching it so i guess if nothing else mm. uh mission accomplished well done damon lindelof um it did make me want to re-watch it um yeah, it's just it was good stuff. And, it, you know, it's interesting because it, it's a lot of stuff that walks that sort of interesting fine line between uh, regular everyday items that drift into sci fi yeah. and superhero stuff. So there's a lot of like things with custom pieces and parts. I don't know. It just it was it's a it's a cool catalog. And I don't think I'm saying anything too out of turn, but sometimes it's nice when play it's nice to see a full catalog like this it's nice when your heritage your prop store take on a tv show and do it 
properly. It's less enjoyable sometimes when a TV show gets dumped into an auction house and it sort of seems like they're just kind of putting it up and they don't really know what they're even selling. You know what I mean? Like even the pictures aren't strong and the write-ups and the identification and what it is. And so, um, and again, this is not me vouching for everything in this auction catalog, but it looks to my blind, to my, to my, my quick view and a quick look at the catalog. It just looked well done. And so I guess I'll go with that and people can write in and go, oh my God, they got episode four's mask wrong and whatever. But I don't yeah. know. I thought it was well done. So I, I was very excited by that. Yeah. And I'm actually, this was, I'm, I must've missed something at somewhere along the way, but this my reaction when I opened that envelope was, oh, screen bids and business with heritage. See, I had the same reaction, but then I think I realized I missed an auction or something. That there was some other uh, okay. show. I wasn't aware. There was something else recently, another TV show that, and I wish I could even say what it was, but it was, you know, it was like, it was another sort of vaguely sci-fi or something like that. And It was, uh, I think, a screen bid one, too. But, yeah, no, I was surprised that they were sort of in business together, um, which I think makes a lot more sense. And, again, it it seems even better, dare I say, than some of the previous screen bid alone stuff. That was my sense of it, this catalog. Yes, I I agree with that. And, um, I mean, screen bid has, has, uh, I mean, apparently or or – uh, or if you if you're paying attention, Screenbit is the one that has the direct road into into HBO, and I, I guess some kind of exclusive deal with anything HBO. So anything that's coming out HBO will go through Screenbit. So maybe this is a sign that some of those bigger HBO shows um, might uh, you know might do more business um, in the in the public auction market. I you know I don't know where all that's headed, and yeah, I really I don't, don't know anything. I'm not I'm not hinting anything. I really don't know anything. I'm just I just I raised an eyebrow. I said, oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, like I said, it just definitely seemed like a a step towards uh, what's the word professionalism in a good way. Yeah. When I found one article here, isn't this great? See, if we were being paid, we could be doing this full time. But no, uh, here no. I am, and I'm just looking to see if I can find what it was that they auctioned. But of course, there doesn't seem to be a mention. Oh well, well they they auctioned something else, but this is what we noticed. So take it some, as you will. There was something yeah. else. Yeah, because um, they're the ones I gave the. Five thousand dollars too for the uh, the uh, the Veep lipstick. The lipstick, but, yeah, but, but that I was will, screen bid alone on its own. It was them alone, and they mostly I seem to identify like the Veep stuff, like where it was from. It wasn't exactly the greatest of picture auctions. If one was looking at wondering yeah. what they what they had and whatnot, you know, and like, oh, can I see the back of that? No, no, you can't. I mean, I guess you could email, but anyway. Um, so kudos. Uh, the, it's a, a, I think a team up in the right direction, I will simply say. And we'll, I'll go with that as an answer. Um, how about you? What's new in props? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. And uh, so t- I, just for the sake, because it's a recent episode, I don't know whether at this point in our order it was last week or a couple weeks ago, but we talked with... Uh, or next with, week, and none of this will make any uh, sense, uh, but go yeah, ahead. Yes. Or calling yes. to you from the future. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Lee Unkrich was on the podcast. Here's what I know. I'm pretty sure that that episode came out the same day Bart and Jared got married. So hopefully this works. There you go. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Go ahead. <laughs> Again, if we were getting paid for this, you know, we'd have yeah. a schedule in front no, of us. We'd know all, all these out. things. Yeah. <laughs> we have so many sponsors. Um, uh, so uh, we had Leon Critch on, uh, uh, Pixar uh, editor, storyteller, director, uh, who is also the world's biggest Shining fan, who uh, talked uh, at length about uh, the 10-year process, mo- more than 10-year process to get yeah, ten years his, plus. Yeah. his making of Shining book up on its feet through, through Toshin. Well, mine arrived, my big limited edition arrived while I was away, and I dragged it into the house, and I dragged it up to my office, and I opened the thing. And it's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's glorious. It's just, it's so glorious that you almost don't want, it's a work of art in the box. You don't want to take it out of the box. No, it is that we, I think we've joked about this, but it is that thing of like, should I get two, like one do, to yeah. keep mint? You know what I mean? Like and one to just keep to, mint. Yeah. And then one to, to wait read. Yeah. For the non-limited edition to actually right, to read, read it. That one. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But it, it, it's awesome. And I actually, to, to illustrate how goddamn heavy the thing is, I, I lift, I, reached down to lift it because they built a custom shipping carton for it. So it's almost exactly the size of the shipping carton. 
the bo- the you know the box within the box. So I went to lift it out carefully because I didn't want to dump it out and like ding a corner or anything. I wanted to try to lift it. <laughs> thing. I really misjudged the weight of the thing and ended up doing the, you know, guy trying to lift a heavy suitcase and just whoa, whoop, 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 and staggered backwards and <laughs> fell on my couch. The delight of my children. They very were all high anxiety. I got it. I got it. I got it. I don't got don't it. Don't got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were all very, very happy to see that happen to dad. And um, it's it's big and cool. And I am, you know, I opened the whole thing and, you know, the the ream of paper, all work and no play, Jack, make Jack a dull boy, the big scrapbook that comes with it, which is a replica sort of of the the scrapbook from, you know, from the film that has a bunch of the behind the scenes photos in it. And then the um, the uh, the book itself, the making of book, which actually is very easily readable. It's done almost like one of those Gideon Bibles. The um the ones yes, that, you find that actually old. is relatively what's the word normal sized I guess yes. like that and, is and readable, readable. Yeah. as opposed to on some of the Toshin books when they're you sort of have yeah. to put them on a table and read them like you know like that so I thought that was a plus yeah yeah the the shining obelisk <laughs> yeah that's uh, <laughs> that's un that's unreadable and uh, not the shining the uh, the two thousand one obelisk yeah, yes exactly, which yeah. came, which came, it, the book came in an obelisk. Um, but, uh, but I'm, I'm excited and I'm actually, I, like I, I promised Lee, I'm reading that thing cover to cover. So I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to dig into that one and congratulations on the book finally coming out and, um, please listen to the episode cause it actually is a, uh, a very good one. Um, or, and maybe then, they've, or maybe they've already listened to it possibly yeah. or they'll listen to it yeah. next week <laughs> or in two weeks or they can listen to it at Bart's wedding. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll <laughs> all work out. Yeah. Lee DJ at Bart's wedding. <laughs> Not That's one of his that. many skills. Shining mm-hmm. fan, Pixar genius, damn fine DJ. Wedding, wedding DJ. DJ. Wedding DJ. Only weddings. <laughs> Not interested in like kids parties, but yeah, good yeah. DJ. Yeah. 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 The guy who DJed my wedding was named DJ VHS because he was specifically from that era. And like, <laughs> it was like smart. a guarantee like, that you'll, and you're going to get like 80s, laughed, 90s. Yeah. He was fantastic. He was fantastic. So many people came up to us and complimented us on the music at the wedding. And it was, we didn't want a band because it's, it's always that like, oh, that kind of whatever cover of that song that I really like, let's just play the song and, um, and the noise and the whatever. And it just like, it, and this, he could transition in and out of things. He was really great, but I just remember that DJ VHS. He was very, very good. Love that guy. Um, and then <laughs> uh, the, I have a second what's new in props because we didn't oh, have a really dear Lord. great yeah great transition tonight but uh, this this is a dave thing but you sent me this great article that we're actually going to talk about tonight because i think it's a very relevant topic to uh what we do is you know what we do for a living and also our our uh our collections both as but yeah both i was gonna say collectors far more important to what we do as collectors we don't really care about what we do for a living <laughs> no correct because it's only at this point just feeding our just to pay for the collection deep-seated yes. problem yes. that we have yeah um and uh, you know what I'm I'm interested in is is sort of it, it's about it's about celebrity, but I'm inter- it's about pop culture and celebrity, but I'm interested in how it affects uh, what what we collect. So the 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 article uh, is from uh, this this uh, uh, publication called the Honest Broker, which Dave yeah, talked a, a little I bit think about. It's a, is it a Substack? It must be a Substack, right? Or maybe, it looks like it. oh yeah, yeah yeah it says yeah. it right right up yeah. here in the uh, the address. Yes, it looks like it. I I just read the e- the the version that you'd sent me in the body of the email. Right, sure, sure, sure. Because you must have shared it there. Um, and the title of the article is "How Long Does Pop Culture Stardom Last?" Uh, the subhead is "I Have a Hunch That Even Huge Stars Are Forgotten After 80 Years," but the the data back that up. And it's by and this author. On, I'm interrupting you for four more seconds. I just want to say, yeah, Ted Gioia, G I O I A, the yeah. honest broker. His Substack. I highly recommend it. He's a he's got a, he's a sort of he's a writer of um, music. Uh, he writes a lot about jazz and music and stuff. But he's sort of taken that and sort of spread his wings and gets into technology sometimes and history and literature and all sorts of things. And I. I'm not the biggest music guy, but I kind of came upon him by accident and I've really enjoyed the Substack. So big recommend uh, on this, uh, on this, on the honest broker, check it out on Substack. But anyway, his, it, the main point that he's sort of talking about, and this is, I guess what we were sort of interested in. And uh, I, I will, I will sort of, uh, I will read the top of this, which is basically back in the 1940s, Bob Hope was the most popular comedian in the world. He was a radio star. He was a movie star. He'd later become a TV star at NBC when Hope died in 2003. It made perfect sense to name the Burbank Airport here in Los Angeles after him. Uh, the airport got renamed. But the only thing that lasts forever in pop culture is the fact that nothing lasts forever. 
by 2017 was only a dim memory at NBC and a young passenger flying to SoCal had no idea who he was. So they changed the name to the Hollywood Burbank Airport. And that is sort of the overall concept of what yeah. this article is. And he sort of identifies 80 years as the typical lifespan of pop culture. Um, and it's really he's not wrong. I mean, let's start with that yeah. there. You know, he's not wrong, um, in, you know, in a wild way. Um, you know, when you think back on, you know, people like Bob Hope, like my kids, no idea. I mean, it's I guess my job at some point I will show them some of the road to movies, but they're going to not have any sense of what a Bob Hope special was. I mean, I'm just just to talk physically about Bob Hope for a second. Um, yeah. Do you or I mean, what a where, special was? Yeah, I was about to say, like, <laughs> is that like the end of your sort of like childhood like where there's still bob hope specials i don't even know no, where you fit in no that. no no, no. i, I yeah. knew i knew bob hope honestly you're gonna laugh yeah. i mean this no. this goes to show what we're talking about yeah. i knew bob hope from the the parody stuff that they did of him the simpsons parodying right. bobby bob hope right. the uso the uso specials the joke you know the jokes and i knew i oh that's a famous comedian that existed before this time that these comedians right these I are making fun of right it's like people know bob hope because dave thomas played him on sctv i know yeah. i i get some right. version of that um i guess the question right. is does anybody know sctv but anyway um I do. But yeah, yeah no, but, it, no, yeah. it's exactly, but it, yeah. that's exactly it. And it's funny because Bob Hope, who, by the way, was also a giant movie star. Some of the other people that they mentioned in the article, guys like Bing Crosby and whatnot, where the movies they were in, you know, and again, same thing with Bob Hope. They, they don't quite resonate in the same way that they do anymore. You know, that they, sorry, that the way that they used to. Yeah. And again, where, what do people remember? And then if we want to take that jump to what we're talking about, um, so if you had a Bob Hope collectible, which might have been, you know, worth something 50 years ago, could have been the, you know, the equivalent of the height of the market. Obviously, now, 50 years later, I, I think if you were in an auction and saw something from Bob Hope, it would be a real sort of like, I'm the only one bidding. And that's yeah. that's both interesting, maybe even fascinating, also scary if you start to think about your collecting. Because is yeah. the thing we're buying today that is very, very popular that we want to hold on to forever, should we not be holding on to it forever? Is there a time to get out before that thing is worthless? I mean, that's year 79, apparently, yeah. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, like right now I have one year to get rid of everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. We still, we still have a little time. The late yeah. 70s are still, is still a ways away, but... I mean, it brings up a really good point. And, you know, it's funny. I was thinking, like, how do I know Bob Hope? And I, I was thinking, I know Bob Hope as I knew him as a kid from the end, uh, that sort of end celebrity extravaganza from the Muppet movie. He's the he's the ice cream yes. man. Yep. And I think that might be the only time that I was actually looking at actual Bob Hope in the flesh. And I think I knew who that was because of the probably the Simpsons. <laughs> right. The, you know, the Simpsons parodies um, and, and things like that. But. I was in yeah, the I mean, car. I was in the car yesterday, and I, I guess we could we'll, we'll get it back to collectibles in a second. But we were. My wife had called up. Uh, she found some f interesting clip of the opening of the 1979, I think, Oscars, and it was just so 1979. Both the people that were there, but also the graphics the and the music, but also <laughs> you know the, just the opening of the ceremony and uh, that that night's ceremony was emceed by Johnny Carson, who did that many, many, many times. And obviously, Johnny Carson, except to my children, who have no idea who yeah. Johnny Carson is. I believe yeah. they only know him from the Simpsons episode. And I'm not sure the name landed so you know the crusty yeah. the crusty returns episode or what you know his where he leaves and comes back and yeah. Johnny Carson yeah um yeah I just which is baffling to me and yet and yet there you I, go yeah I only saw you'll appreciate this as a as a uh comedian and as a uh as a, a fan of television I only saw one episode ever of the Johnny Carson show and it was the final episode. And the only reason I did it was because I didn't know who the hell Johnny Carson right. was. I just knew that everybody knew him and talked about him and right. everybody was talking about and how this it was, was the a end. thing. Yeah. And I, I like stayed up, you know, I, I like 
I like subversively stayed up, like past my bedtime, turned on the little TV in my in my bedroom, turned the volume way down because I wanted to be. I knew it was history. It was like when 1992, or I was probably in, I was in middle school, and um, I just knew history was happening, and I had a sense of it, and I wanted to be. I wanted that to be a thing that I could say that I did, and I did, and it was uh, it was so it was so cool, but. I mean that, you know, and look, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged man now in my mid forties and like Johnny Carson is, was almost irrelevant to me. So imagine what it's like for your kids. But now let's take that one step further, which is you, let's jump to the sort of movie world. And it's sort of like, you know, we're, we see it all the time. I mean, obviously our, uh, you know, collecting has changed. We've talked often on the show, the way sort of the collecting world started sort of a lot of, with a lot of like, uh, the costumes, especially the dresses, mm-hmm. that was sort of the beginnings of, in some ways, you know, movie prop collecting, and that obviously has sort of died out. There's still a, there's still a group, but the, again, the numbers, the numbers that you're seeing, you know, where any dress yeah. from a really fabulous movie worn by a fabulous star, but here we are, and those fabulous stars less remembered, those movies less remembered, but collecting changes, uh, and. I think, you know, we've seen it a little bit. Let's just jump into it with some of the 60s television stuff where I think there was a period of time where you're lost in spaces, your Star Treks, your Munsters, your Batman 60s. And I'm sure I'm forgetting other 60s shows. Lost in space. Yeah. Yeah, But those were the height of the height of the, the what's the word I'm looking for? The height of the market, that those things were big dollar items. And now... You might say, okay, on a given week, people still want a Kirk. There are still people out there that want a Kirk, a Spock, and a McCoy. But there are a lot less people that want, you know, a Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. And I'm not even sure we're at 80 years. I guess we're if that was 1960 something. I guess we're we're getting close. We're at 60, we're, you know, we're in the 60, 60 plus years, years. But we're but already I would seeing make those case, declines. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I I would make the case to you that the only reason the reason people care about Kirk and Spock versus Dr. Smith is because Kirk and Spock brilliantly continued on in new iterations of popular culture. So it is the it is the new fans finding them 20 years later in the movies that they loved that were then going back and saying, oh, I, I want to watch no, the original I agree. TV and series. I think we're even lost to, space right. And I even think to some extent... Apologies people, to the Matt LeBlanc. No, I vehicle. know. I know. I was going to say there yeah. is a Netflix one. But I was going to say, yeah, I do think there's probably even somebody that turns on Picard and falls in love and then works their way way backwards to that. And I guess that's the interesting thing, which is what happens when, and this article also does talk a little bit about this, what that there are, there are examples of things that break the 80 year rule. The wizard of Oz is something Elvis is sort of something where we don't necessarily remember Elvis's individual movies, but Elvis is still Elvis. And actually I've been reading, I read another interesting article, which I didn't send you, which is about the ongoing dispute. Now that Lisa Marie Presley, uh, sadly passed away uh, either one month ago or 11 months ago, depending on when this is airing. I think she died on Bart's wedding day, if memory serves, but um, she well, passed he's not away. A suspect. Yes, exactly. We know where he was. Um, she passed away, and now there is a dispute in the estate between her mother, Priscilla Presley, Elvis's widow, and the granddaughter, that Riley Keough, the star of Daisy Jones and the Six, is that new show? Yeah. Well, also, yeah. also one of the um, one of the uh, uh, the 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 virgins in. Um... Oh, that's right. In, uh, in uh, Mad Max. Mad Max. Fury uh, Road. Fury Road. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what it talked about was how the Elvis estate makes money. And it talks sort of about, you know, what makes money. And obviously they, they you know, they were, they've had, they've made money by selling off rights, but Elvis had gotten rid of the song rights years ago. So it's not about the music and he didn't own those movies and people don't remember those movies. They obviously have turned him into this icon and it's the ability to, you know, whatever, buy and Elvis lunchbox or a shirt with Elvis on it and that kind of stuff. And Graceland that continues to make them money every year in the same way that like Marilyn Monroe does and those things. And so that's an example where you sort of have the icon, the face has be, is still something, but again, there, the movies have fallen away. So for example, if you were to dig into like an Elvis movie, is there prop demand for an Elvis movie? Or if there is, is it really only like, 
you know, Viva Las Vegas, that that's maybe the one that people can remember, but that when you get into the sort of, you know, the seven or eight or 20 other ones he made, people don't remember as well. And again, that's, that's part of it. That's, that's part of this, uh, I guess, evolution of pop culture that this article is talking about. Yeah. And Elvis is an interesting example because I, I wonder, I mean, I wonder if, if we're on the cusp of that going away too, where like, I feel like he, he exists and they, and they get into this sort of obliquely in the article. Um, the idea of these sort of silhouettes, these icons like Charlie right. Chaplin, you know, as, people, people recognize the silhouette, the icon, but do right. they actually know Everybody, who Charlie everyone Chaplin Everyone knows is? sort of what the, cha- what the, the what the, the little tramp. tramp looks like. I almost called him the little champ, but the little <laughs> tramp looks like he was a champ, but everyone knows what it is, what it looks like. Has anyone ever seen it? No. Um, does right. anyone? What does anyone want to see it? Probably not. Do they? Can even, anyone you know, quote yeah. a title? Right. You know, uh, maybe. I mean, city maybe. lights. City lights. There you go. I mean that. You know, I would say modern times. I mean, you know, that's that's where I go. But um, or the Gold Rush or whatever. But uh, all excellent, by the way. I mean, really, if you want to be delighted, if you really want to be delighted for an hour or an hour and ten minutes, go back and just watch that great run of the Chaplin Silence and Harry Lloyd, by the way. My gut, my goodness, the Harry Lloyd stuff is is fantastic, and and so is um the third one. What's his name? Buster Keaton. There you go, Buster Keaton. It, Buster Keaton is the one that I think I think is actually the the best of the three in terms of the physical performances and the and the crazy stunts that he did. Um, but that's I mean those are both great examples. Buster Keaton and uh and Harry Lloyd could they didn't have the Tramp character. They were just as famous in the time. Could anybody pick them out of a no. lineup? Nope. Zero. I mean, Buster Keaton's having a minute right now where uh, I believe uh, there's two different books out right now, two interesting biographies, mm-hmm. and I've been meaning to, I want to read one of them. Oh, I'm, I'm into and, that. Yeah, and then they actually just announced that uh, 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 biographer extraordinaire uh, Romy Malik uh, will be uh, playing him in a, uh, I don't I, in a, a oh, TV show. Oh, I can show. see that. Yeah, okay, show, I yeah. can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he kind of he does. Has a does. look, yep, has a yeah, look. Yeah. And I think that will definitely do something for buster keaton but i'm not quite sure it's ever going to bring back a demand to see the movies and again you know and in the prop collecting world and again no one necessarily ever set out to be buster keaton prop collectors but if you were that market seems done i guess is the larger point i'm sort of trying to make here yeah what is the market if you had a if you had a guaranteed sort of photo match, whatever, even tramp, you know, right. cane, hat, something, costume, yeah, that's valuable. And my my sort of collector instinct goes, oh yeah, tell me more about it. I don't know that I'm going after it. I don't know that I'm buying it. And what is that? I don't think we're going actually... after it. And I do wonder after sort of, you know, the Academy Museum gets theirs, you know, I could see the first one, but if, you know, 10 of them showed up, I mean, I guess you could argue this is maybe true about anything, but if 10 of them showed up, I do think the demand sort of falls off very quickly, Fairly but, simple, it, yeah. but it has to be the hat, the jacket, the cane and or like the shoes. I was well the shoes and I was going to say like maybe the little makeup jar that made yeah. the I mean I don't you know I don't know you know I, again I, I think it has to be those things I don't think anyone's interested in you know the blind girl's outfit do you know what I mean I don't think yeah. anyone's interested in the rich guy's outfit or the little yeah. kid's outfit I don't think anybody's interested in the soup bowl you know it's sort of and then even when you get into some the, of his other the bread, movies the bread the di- shoes yep exactly but i was gonna say the dictator you know he he made his dictator i don't think yeah. anybody wants the dictator costume they want the little tramp i mean you know going it's sort of same thing with elvis and again obviously with elvis there's the music side and so people probably do want this costume he wore to like you know the las vegas you yeah. know tour you know the, the the you know whatever but but again, going back to the movies, does anybody want anything from Blue Hawaii? And again, I'm sure someone does. But I think, again, that market has sort of but fallen away. Yeah. The thing that's keeping the Elvis thing alive is the music. It's not the it's not the right. movies stuff, right? So I mean, it's, we it would bra- agree on that? Sort of it, yes. So it, 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 there's a reason 
for those, um, which is, I guess, different than, say, why the Wizard of Oz survived. So things do survive. But I, what I, the point I was going to make, and again, I do hate that we're – I don't mean to make this all about – the market but i do think it's about i guess it's not about it's specific relevant. values but it's about i think it's about your collecting in general you hear stories all the time and by the way often of like well-to-do people that pass away and are, you know have a big house full of you know gorgeous furniture and art but not like necessarily they didn't buy van gogh's they just bought like the art that people would have bought in the 50s or the art that people would have bought in the 60s or the 70s and ultimately it's all just kind of worthless like because it's just stuff that was popular and had value and seemed like something and now people are not so interested in it and yeah it is something to think about in a in a in a way now i do think you know some of the stuff that unfortunately we collect um does break through that 80 year law i think obviously star wars breaks through that 80 year law i think raiders breaks through that 80 year law i can't speak for certainly every the cat Arnold, in the hat. yeah certainly can that certainly the the other dictator um but and i certainly can't speak for all of arnold schwarzenegger but much in the way that arnold schwartz that that, that charlie mm. chaplin became the tramp i think right. as years go by arnold schwarzenegger slowly has become just the terminator in a funny way and yeah. so i think terminator stuff is always a little evergreen in a way but dare i say people are less interested in predator or mm -hmm. uh, our german friends uh last action hero um so you know what i mean like i, I he's becoming sort of chaplin-esque in but that i way. think yeah i think arnold uh yes and i agree with you I think Arnold, uh, in 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 the analysis of history, when you know when he passes on, is going to be a Clint Eastwood character, where it's where it actually, it is about his oeuvre and the Austrian oak and the fact that there was no one quite like him. And yes, there will be more popular titles within there. It's always going to be about the man with no name versus you know Pale Rider or something like that. But Pale Rider is lifted up by the stardom of Clint Eastwood. It's all true, but I do think a lot of those things. I mean. It's a funny thing. Like, I'm not sure people remember Crazy Harry. I mean, in the same way. Anymore. Dirty Harry? Dirty Harry. What did I say? Crazy Harry. Jesus. <laughs> Dear Lord. Dear Lord. Crazy Eddie? I remember him. Crazy Eddie was great. Prices are insane. Went to, went to jail. But, went to yeah. jail yeah. because his prices were too insane. Um uh, that's a distinctly uh, Northeast reference, yes? Maybe tri-state area reference? Tri-state, I think. I think. Only. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll, every now we'll and then, on the I feel feed. like every ten years, somebody does an article on like all of the, what went on at that crazy Eddie, like all the the financial shenanigans. It's always yeah. a very His enjoyable prices are read. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. But that guy obviously wasn't Eddie. That was just the TV guy. Yeah. Right. Which, but as a child, I thought that was Eddie himself. That was Eddie. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Let your pieces shine with Prop Store. Prop Store, PropStore.com, uh, does more than any other entertainment memorabilia auction company to put the spotlight on your pieces in their auctions. They have videos for every auction. Prop Store puts together fun and educational Instagram videos hosted by Stephen, Tim, Brandon, Chuck, and others at Prop Store to tell the stories behind the pieces in the auction. Prop Store also regularly invites partners like Tested to record in-depth stories about the film and television treasures it sells. And also Dave Mandel, host, uh, co-host of yeah. the Stuff Dreams Are Made Of, will go over there and touch some things, which is always very fun. Uh, social media. Become one of over 200,000 followers Prop Store has on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to see what Prop Store is offering and sign up for Prop Store's mailing list to get the latest updates on their auctions. For each auction, Prop Store also runs a paid social media campaign to attract new bidders. Plus, they set up at different shows to attract new bidders as well. You'll see them. They were just at the uh, the Star Wars celebration along with us. That was very exciting. Um, and uh, what I will say about Prop Store in their defense is, uh, you know, when you sign up for their uh, email list, they don't overwhelm you. Uh, they don't. Uh, I, I find that like it's no, the right very amount respectful. of email, which is actually very solid. Um, 
one would hope though that some of those 200,000 Instagram followers might actually follow us but such is not the case uh, apparently apparently not but anyway onward onward press not quite not quite yet uh prop stores auctions get worldwide press from stories about the X-wing that sold for 2.375 million dollars thanks to Dave Mandel to a pair of Walter White's set deck <laughs> underwear that wasn't in any of the articles though sadly it was yeah, not <laughs> yeah. it was not selling recently for $32,500 and then was apparently burned um you'll see uh you always see stories in the press about prop stores auction, which also help bring new bidders to the table. Uh, podcasts and live streams. Prop store help gets. Oh, there you go. Prop store helps get the word out on podcasts like the stuff dreams are made of and hosts live streams with forums like comic art fans to showcase specific types of items like original artwork, which are part of the larger auction. So, yeah. So just know that while their prop auctions have a lot of different things in it and they will find the place they'll find the podcast they'll find the website whatever to make sure your item gets a spotlight on and it's really great because i think they've gotten in that last auction when they had the rinsler comic art uh, uh artwork in the back of their auction they kind of billboarded that and the comic books you know on the comic websites and they got some really nice numbers on that so they kind of go out of they their did. way as opposed to just throwing it all in and hoping for what's best so i think that's a pretty good thing and uh, there are going, Ryan. online catalogs and printed catalogs. Other auction houses may only provide one or two pictures. Prop Store's online catalog has multiple high-quality pictures with super zoom functionality, so you can see all the details that potential buyers might want to see. And the printed catalogs uh, for many of their larger auctions, um, Prop Store creates full-size printed catalogs. They are really works of art. It says it in the ad, but they really are. They can be ordered at PropStore.com. They also create smaller highlight catalogs. Uh, that they mail to a larger cross section of the mailing list uh, to give you an idea of what they're about to sell. And the thing about the super zoom, just to jump in on that for a second, is there are so many other auctions where it's just like I I can't see the item. I mean, literally, I can't see the item, can't zoom in on it, can't yeah. whatever. And obviously, as we've said to you a thousand times, do your research, do your research, do your research. Propster is going to try and match it if they can. They're going to let you know, like, hey, we screen matched it. But even if you can't screen match it, you're going to be able to zoom in and you're going to be able to see, like, how it was made. Maybe there's some telltale sign or something that you've read about or heard about somewhere else that makes you feel good about that purchase. You know what I mean? Like, so again, this, they're not, tr no one's trying to hide anything. Zoom on in, check the piece out. Uh, it, it's it's truly worth it. Uh, and then live preview events for their semi-annual entertainment memorabilia live auctions out of Los Angeles and London. Propster hosts live events showcasing items in museum-like settings, allowing buyers to see the prices up of uh, the prices, the pieces up close before they bid on them. You don't get to know the prices till later. So are you considering consigning some pieces from your collection to auction? Let Propstore's expansive marketing help you achieve top prices. Visit propstore.com slash sell or email consign at propstore.com. That's consign at propstore.com to discuss how Propstore can help you sell your entertainment treasures. Take it on home, Ryan. And as always, don't forget to use the Dave 10 or Ryan 10 discount. Dave 10. So it's 10% off your entire buy now purchase at propstore.com and vote for your favorite podcast host at the same time. You know, and again, but again, with Clint Eastwood, like, I think key guns, key hats, but I feel like the movies are falling away. I don't know. I mean, I, again, and by the way, there's a beauty to that. I mean, I think if there are uh, things, if yeah. you like something, I think as long as you're walking into it, knowing I'm buying something I love, that to me is the only rule. You know, that's our rule from day one. I'm buying something I love, but where it gets, I guess, dangerous is if you're buying something you like because you think it's a good investment, which gets us back to that sort of investment yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I would also say buying something you love in today's era, it didn't matter 10 years ago because who, you know, who cares? Uh, prices have gotten so, so crazy that you, it really, even, even with a, even with a Star Wars piece that you truly, truly love, yeah. you have to ask every year, is this the top of the market? Um, will I ever be a, because I mean, if you're spending $2 million on an X wing, you really do have to ask yourself in maybe, maybe in 10 years, I get my money out of that. Uh, but in 15 and 20 and like, I'm not, this is not, I love it so much. This is not something that I'm buying to hold on for 10 years. It's something that I'm buying to die with. Right. And, and does that, does that leave, you know, does that leave my heirs in a, in a, in a, 
in a position. And I, you know, I well, honestly, yeah, I don't they, know. Are my heirs going to be sitting there with their Bob Hope collection going, what are we supposed to do with this? Nobody cares. That's um, right. I do think Star Wars does, you know, and again, for some of those similar reasons, you know, breaks through, you know, it's it, Star Wars becomes right. that Wizard of Oz, if you will, of maybe our lifetime in a good way. I think, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, this is this is a tough one. You know, obviously they've kept it going. Perhaps for you know me as an older fan, I have not enjoyed the keeping it going as much. But obviously, it does keep it going. You know, so the two sides to that coin, which is, can you keep something going so much that you actually damage the original? I mean, then maybe that's another discussion. Yeah. But, well, yeah. Go ahead. F- funny you should raise it because I was just pulling up the quote. So there was this. This article in uh, Comic Book Resources uh, recently, um, the the headline being a very incendiary, Star Wars fans don't care about an original trilogy theatrical cut, says Jon Favreau, uh, which uh, immediately um, uh, sent my my rage cortex into... (laughs) into overdrive. So I click baited it. I clicked it. What he actually says in the article is much less incendiary, but it is upsetting. Um, the, the actual quote is, do you think any, he was asked about the, uh, demand for the original theatrical cuts, the, you know, the cuts that you and I saw and grew up with both in the theaters and on VHS that have now been, uh, been, uh, sullied and ruined and basically buried for all time to such to a point where there's an entire generation. Basically, if you didn't, you know, if you if you were born right, you after never, I don't know, nineteen eighty seven, nineteen eighty eight, you likely have never seen You've never seen it. There's Star Wars. I, I think it's more than likely. You've never technically seen the original version of Star Wars. Yeah. Right. And um and, and Favreau so what Favreau actually said was do you do you think anybody but us, like the people who grew up with it would care because what I figured out is the younger people have a whole different perception of what Star Wars is. And he's casting doubt that there would be enough demand out there to make it worthwhile to release the original trilogy, which I mean, demand, how much would it actually cost? I mean, it's pressing it. It's pressing it. They have the thing. We know they have the thing. We know they have a 4k transfer of the thing. It's there. It's sitting in some locker. It hasn't been released because I don't know. I don't. I really don't know the reason. I. I mean, the the reason is Mr. George Lucas. He's not here to defend himself. That's the reason. But there but is John no Favreau other reason. is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Favreau. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, friend of the show. Maybe he yeah. can explain himself. <laughs> uh, but but so there's two kind of things going on here. First, being incensed over the fact that I mean, literally, the film that won all the Oscars does not exist anymore. The 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 Oscar for editing went to a film that does not exist anymore. Right. I can't think of another example where that is true except for a lost silent film. And I would go so far as to say, I don't think there are any silent films that won an Oscar that were lost because they preserved them because they were important. It, it's insane. Other than the wizard no, of in, Oz, in this is the most other, popular in, in movie of all world, time. And I, and I know fanboys, whatever, and I'm sure we get pushed into that category of, Oh, you're just, you know, it's his movie, whatever, whatever. But no, in any other world were he not, I guess, George Lucas or whatever, People would be screaming like, no, 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 you know, you're ruining it. You're ruining it. You're ruining it across the board that like, you know, whatever, even the the Library of Congress wouldn't accept the second version. You have to give us the original version. I I don't know what they have, but I'm guessing they have the special edition, unfortunately. Uh, It's 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 I mean, it's it's. Maybe they have a print. Maybe they have a right. print like you have the original. It, it's it's so fucking crazy. It's so fucking and it's so. What does it matter? But what does way, it matter? Get, just if you put it out there, it doesn't fucking change anything. People are going to watch whatever they want to watch anyway. They're still going to go watch the book of Boba Fett. It doesn't matter. Just give well, us the thing think, that we want. I don't think the original is hurting the book of Boba Fett or vice versa. I, what is me, hurting the right, book of Boba Fett? To Dave? me, what was interesting about the argument was it was a very sort of strange argument because it was sort of a. It was a self-fulfilling argument. It was basically, I'm never going to let you see this thing. And my reason for never letting you see this thing is I can prove that you don't want to see it. Well, it's like you've never let me see it. You know, it's like you want to prove it, then put it out. Put and it let's to a take vote. a vote. Let's take a vote. Put but it, to put a it vote. out first. But you can't say people don't. No one can see it. 
No, and and the reason is is because nobody knows about it. Well, no one knows about it because no one can see it. You know, it I, up, I, I have, do agree. Have Criterion license it tomorrow yeah. in 4K. To, you know, it's not available on streaming anywhere. Right. Put it on Just on physical put it out, disc. Charge me a thousand dollars. Ninety nine ninety nine yeah. for it. And you will you will sell ten million copies in the first week to a bunch of Gen Xers who all they have is disposable income and rage, and <laughs> and they will buy it and they will watch it and they will love it. I mean, it's fucking insane. But it goes. It, this isn't just a Star Wars rant. It is, believe me. But um, but it goes to this larger point of it. We're not even fifty years into Star Wars, and if that's already in the conversation, if it's already that people have forgotten the thing that everybody fell in love. With, it's like it, it's like if the color version of Wizard of Oz didn't exist anymore, and all we heard were stories about it. I mean, imagine that. It, it's it's bananas. But. The fact is there's been so much Star Wars since then that there are, like we were talking about with Star Trek earlier, there are so many generations now of Star Wars fans that all came to it in a different way. I mean, I've got kids in my, you know, my daughter's, you know, grammar school coming in and their first exposure is Clone Wars or whatever. Say, and that's they, great. Like, they watch the cartoons and that's all they know. They that's, yeah. And that's great. That's totally great. You know, he is not going to get, you know, Jane, Jane's little playmate is not going to care about whether or not we, you know, we have the, you know, the, the unjawified version of Moss Eisley. They're just, they're just not going to care. And, and that, I mean, it, depre it depresses me, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't exist. But I guess it's all part of this, you know, does anybody care about the well, entire original trilogy in 20 years? Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, again, when we get to whatever, 1977 plus 80, um, when we get there, 2057. Yeah. What is the state? I mean, I guess, what is the state of Star Wars? You know, you, you keep seeing even rumblings on the movies. I mean, it's been a while, by the way, that we should point out that a Star Wars movie has come out. And while lots of rumors and stories of things yeah. that are coming down the pike, it's not tomorrow. It's not anytime soon. So it's probably a couple of years till the next Star Wars movie. And I guess what I wonder, and again, maybe this is the larger sort of prop sort of question is down the line in, say, 2057, does it become the kind of thing where a stormtrooper helmet is a stormtrooper helmet and a lightsaber is a lightsaber, but the notion of having a piece of... I don't know, like a Jawa boot, let's say, like a, you know, let, let's say an yeah. individual piece, or by the way, even a Jawa, not that I have a Jawa, but even like a piece of something do you do? that is, I don't, I don't, I've never, oh, okay. never, never had one. I'm neither boot nor, nor, nor outfit. They're um, super cool. They would, it would be incredible. But when you get past the iconic pieces in 80 years, is that what falls off first? So that, you know, in the same way that like with the Wizard of Oz, I think, obviously, the Cowardly Lion's costume, that's something. Ruby slippers, obviously, that's something. You know, Dorothy's dress. We can go through the items and pick them out. However, when you start getting into Munchkin's left shoe or that, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff, is that yeah. where we're sort of seeing numbers kind of going like this? And again, yeah. not... Not that that's a problem if you love it, but again, something to think about. And if one were to be thinking that way, is there a point to whether it's forget about top of the market, like forgetting about like even I'll simply say not necessarily trying to maximize an investment, but simply is there a time where people should think about getting out of their collection, maybe just because so that you're not hanging a worthless collection on the next generation. I guess these are things to think about. I don't have an answer to it, but it just, yeah. it, your head does go there. I mean, I like to think of, I'm going to keep everything forever, but you know, I do wonder like, and I've joked about it, but like, what the hell are my kids going to do with it all? Do you know what I mean? And it's one thing, it's one thing yeah. that they may go, okay, I, we know what to do with this Darth Vader helmet. This can go into, you know, this can go into auction, but I'm just trying to think of something. What are they necessarily going to do with my Uther Seven pen, my, my, helmets. Yeah, my Uther Pendragon Excalibur helmet? Do you know uh, what I mean? What is the market yeah. for that going to be? in whatever 2057 I, and again i'm not picking on excalibur i'm just simply saying there are things i truly love that are just somewhat meaningless already to my children and the next generation by the way let me go the other way for one second 
I find it quite enjoyable. The fact that a great, interesting, inter- like an interesting prop from like a seventies movie shows up that nobody cares about. I can pick it up for yeah. a couple of grand in a world where I can be in some ways as happy with that item as I would be with a $10 million star Wars item. That's a, that's, that's, you know, it's good bang for your, your buck, so to speak, you know, that I can find right, something true. I love. And there is something to be said for, the as other people forget and i remember it gets back to you know what i got into collecting for in the first place which is to buy the things i like and i don't really care i think the danger is when you're spending top dollar on something that may not be top dollar tomorrow i I guess in the in the economic discussion that's that's the thing that i now you know that i now worry about and i mean thankfully you know we both have good jobs this feels like it is still a hobby to us but you know the pure dollars and cents of it where i used to justify it by just saying look it's an investment right you know you invest you invest money in t-bills and in, in uh you know uh, your money manager puts you into into equity and bonds and all that and part of his physical assets and we you know we're very good you and i very good at investing in physical assets but you have to start to right. wonder where you know particularly as we go through this generation which you know if 60s television started to die you know, five to 10 years ago, we're dealing with 70s and 80s film. So it's not, if it follows the pattern, I don't, th- it's not terribly far off. Right. There was an auction when I first started getting into it is when all of like the, uh, the Star Trek costumes kind of came out and mm-hmm. the, the amount of also, I don't know what to call it, like the guest costumes. I think we talked about this a little bit with Rob Klein on one of our earliest shows, the sort of the actor of the week costumes. So that like, for example, mm. they land on a planet and these are what those people were wearing. You know what and I mean? Bob like, Hope is yeah. there. Exactly. Um, but, you know, it would be those people, the black and white guy, you know, this guy's space yeah. suit, this kid's, you know, Roman toga, whatever it was from those those various episodes. And, you know, space girls, lots of C- Captain Kirk space girls. When Green those lady. things first showed up, the the hunger and the run on those was quite incredible. And again, now when those things show up, I hate to say nobody cares, but let me just simply say, if you still cared, you could build that collection a lot easier than when yeah. it showed up. And again, these are not bad things. It is just simply something one needs to pay attention to and I guess be aware of. That That's the larger, I guess, issue, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. And again, I don't have an answer to it. Um, I do I wonder one, I though. One. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, you, know, you were saying yeah. to fin- oh. finish your thought. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I just, I, I guess I'm, it's a, it's a, it's another lens. I will simply say for looking at one's collection, especially if one, one's condo has flooded recently and mm. one is thinking about like what's important, but I, and I, I don't know. And that's, and again, not from a, not from a, even purely monetary expression, although obviously it's connected to monetary, but also just in like, what is important, what's lasting, what truly makes me happy, all of those things. But also maybe there are some things where it's time to get rid of stuff just because, you know, I'm keeping one, but get rid of two. I don't know. And again, I realize that's all very hypothetical, but it's just, it's a lens to look at your stuff is I guess my only point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally, I totally agree, and and this doesn't affect my my love or passion or anything. And it's not going to affect anything that I do, but I do question because uh, there's another category of this that I have, which is the mul- the the thing that there's generational versions of. We talked about this a little bit with Star Wars, but you know, right here to my to my right, um, I have an entire collection of '89 Batman, right, and and I think Batman is evergreen. I think in 40 years, there will still be Batman. They will still be telling Batman stories. I just, I just think it's, it's the kind of thing. It's like James Bond, uh, presuming James Bond uh, continue, continues to thrive. It just feels like one of those things that will always be there. But will people, everybody has their Batman, just like, just like the right. uh, Adam West Batman seems to have seen its, seen its zenith. Um, uh, you know, Keaton is having a bit of a resurgence now because of the Flash movie. We'll see how that goes. Right, but um, what happens when we're 40 Batmans down correct. the line? Yeah. No, correct. that's a very yeah. interesting point. You know, in comic art collecting, which sort of is, you know, whatever, my origin story, um, it was interesting. Before I got into comic art collecting, the uh, the wardrobe collecting of the comic art world was strip mm. art, 
was like the 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 dailies mm. and Sundays, the comic strip okay. art. And so in the sixties and seventies, like 70, Ziggy's and things like that, mostly Ziggy's. It was really it's all Ziggy's and Garfield. Um, yeah. You know, the when people sort of in the sixties were collecting into the seventies, even into the eighties, it was the you know, the, the things like these, you know, gorgeous, like, you know, Alex Raymond, Flash Gordons and, you know, mm. Prince Valiance and stuff yeah, were Prince just, Valiant, you know, yeah. yeah, incredible. And obviously like um, McKay, Little Nemo and Slumberlands and stuff like that, where those those gore. I mean, the, the Sundays were often, you know, like, you know, huge. And even the dailies were beautiful, you know, just the, the pen and ink of these things um, was that's where collecting was. And comic book pages nobody cared about and so that was the junk almost i think into the like late 80s early 90s that was the junk strip art was where it was at and when you look even at the early uh sotheby's and christie's catalogs who used to do comic art auctions um into the nine in the 90s you can see you can see comic regular comic book art superhero stuff starting to here and like taking over but the earliest days of it it's you see the strip art the strip art the strip art mm. and nowadays yes but did that ever hit numbers like comic book art well, does now i mean again this is where it gets hard i think they never got millions of dollars but the numbers they were getting at the time were the top of the market yeah so relatively yes i mean they got crazy numbers for the time if that makes any sense yeah um much in the way i think you know wardrobe did you know and but yeah. what ends up happening of course is you know now we want wardrobe from certain movies but back then obviously well if you know if if whatever grace kelly wore this in any movie it didn't matter it was a grace kelly you know dress and it's important and now we kind of go well, is it Grace Kelly from To Catch a Thief? You know, it's that kind of a thing. Whereas, I don't know, The Country Girl goes away, just to pick another Grace Kelly movie. Yeah. I'm mixing my metaphors far too much here. But where I'm going with it is, so in comic art... The and where does art, that strip art sell, sit now? Key items will still sell, as they always Ziggies. did. The Ziggies. The be but the best Ziggies, like Ziggy number one. Um, but the honest answer is, is the, the market just isn't there. Um, even mm. like, even within the superhero market, and this is a good example. Do you remember Crisis on Infinite Earths? I mean, you mm -hmm. were probably, you're it's like, or at least the, the idea of Crisis on Infinite yep. Earths, which is something DC has kind of kept going. And I'm guessing has been like, I think they did it on their TV shows. I'm sure they're going to do it in their movies. And they, they, they've now done a million crises, but the original Crisis on Infinite Earths was this big comic book event, uh, uh, written by Marv Wolfman and drawn by George Perez um, with some help from some others. And there was a moment where this stuff did stuff like Supergirl died, the flash died. And then they had a new Wally West took over. Flash. it was a huge momentous sort of comic book shift and all that they did. And they got rid of earth too. And again, it all gets very complicated and not the point of the story, but there was a time where that was the most important story, you know, most important story in DC comics, and the covers and even the pages from those issues were just, you know, again, the bee's knees, you know, like top of the market, huge numbers. And over the years, Supergirl has come back. Uh, the Flash has come back. I mean, all the stuff that was yep. done in those issues has sort of, you know, been undone. And I don't think they're valueless. But again, I can only speak for myself. I used to have a bunch of crisis stuff and I still fondly remember it. And I kept like one thing just to remind myself, but I had a number of things. And for me, the more they undid it, if you will, the more they made yeah. the story less relevant, even though I still liked the story. I don't know. It just, it, it, it lost its, it lost its resonance. I didn't get rid of it because I thought it's not going to be worth something. I got rid of it because I didn't care as much anymore and I get, let Which it go. Is indicative yes, exactly, of, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I can't say everyone agreed with me. I'm just saying that's what I thought. And I do think, how does one apply that again to, to prop world? I don't know. I don't have the perfect answer is at some point, you know, we don't know anything, but, you know, hearing a lot of weird rumors about the, the new Indiana Jones and problems they're having with the ending and stuff like that. Who the hell knows? I, I'm sure it's their nightmare, you know, that to hear people talking about things like that. But, you know, I don't know, like if if all of a sudden, you know, 10 years from now, there's somebody else playing Indy, which seems hard to imagine. I don't know. What does that mean? I, again, I don't have an answer. Uh, I, I'd like to think yeah. the man with the hat and the whip is 
is the, just the little tramp, you know, is, is the little tramp. Yeah. But yeah. does that maybe mean nobody cares as much about Shankara stones and stuff? I, I don't know. You know, I, yeah. I guess where does it fall away? And where do these things mean when the See, icon replaces the movies and the movie knowledge? I guess is another yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah. I've always had this theory about indie, which po possibly is a bit rose colored glasses, but I've always had this theory about indie that it would, it, it, in the final analysis, it would last longer than the original trilogy of Star Wars because because it's period and because it's meant to look and feel old. So that when you come to watch, you know, A New Hope, and if we're so lucky to ever see the original version of New <laughs> Hope again, the fact that it, you know, the effects will just simply look right outdated, uh, just the way the original series of Star Trek looks outdated. Um, whereas that really won't, I'm sure there are some effects and Raiders and things that are, are not up to, you know, current standards, but because it's a period piece and it will always live in that time in that romantic era, I always wondered if that just, if it holds its nostalgic value for longer. I see what you're saying that because it, it's sort of timeless, it's Casablanca yes. as yes. opposed to Metropolis. Although, do do people know Casablanca? I mean, I know they they know it exists, yeah, I mean, but are they they still watching for, it? For okay. sure. But I okay. feel like that's one yeah. of the ones that like sits. But you know, you, you you bring up Casablanca. I mean, I would counter with Gone with the Wind. I think I think Casablanca has totally weathered it. But I think Gone with the Wind has become one of those sort of people know the title, but they could right. not. You they know. don't know Cl it. Clark it's... Clark Gable. I mean, I I read this in I read this in a in a in a, one of my many uh, Hollywood memoirs that I that I passed my time reading because I really enjoy them. Um, somebody made the point in one of these that was along similar lines that Clark Gable at one point was the most famous face on planet Earth. Right. Anybody in any country could have picked out Well, Clark you know Gable. the famous story that he wore an undershirt in uh, It Happened One Night, you know, in the, mm. which is the first, you know, it's the mm -hmm. first movie to ever win like all the Oscars, like it won for everything. But yeah, apparently he comedy. took his shirt off in like the hotel room scene and he's got an undershirt on. I, I can't remember the specifics, but there's a scene where he's got an undershirt on and it changed the undershirt industry in the united states of america uh, that's a you know that that's i mean funny. yeah I, well it was when yeah. they were sharing the they when yes, they had the exactly. trailer with yes. the the divider right right yeah. and um and uh it it you know but anyway this person was making the point that clark gable was once the most famous recognizable face on the planet earth right. more recognizable than whoever the president was at that time um and now you know people know the name oh you know maybe re vaguely associated with um gone with the wind but could you know could our kids pick nope. him out of a lineup? No way. It's so funny. Could this film is, students right now right. pick him out of a lineup? It's funny. Part of it has to do with, by the way, the entire sort of streaming world and the 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 advent of so much choice. There was something to be said right. for a world where on Sundays, like the ABC Sunday night movie or whatever is going to have on you know, is going to have like the 10 commandments on, on Easter weekend, which it, it, it still does. I think they still air it, oh, really? but you, but now you have a million other choices. So people don't watch it, but once upon a time you had to kind of watch the 10 commandments once a year, you kind of watch the wizard of Oz once a year on TV. You kind of, you know what I mean? It's like you watched gone with the wind I can't remember if they, I feel like they broke Gone with the Wind up into pieces and it was like a two night event, mm. but you, you were, I hate to say you were forced to, but you were kind of forced to. I watched Abbott and Costello because it was on on Sunday mornings and there wasn't much else. I watched the Three Stooges for the same reason. I watched Bob Hope and Bing Crosby Road to movies on Sunday afternoons because that was my only choice. I watched yep. Star Trek because it was my only yep. choice. And now you're in that world where, and you hear this from bands all the time, like they get up there to play their music or to play. And I, I don't, I don't mean to make this about the quote unquote newest album, but in some ways the audience is bothered by the fact that they're not in control of every song that's getting played in a concert because yeah. they're just used to, whether it's, you know, Spotify or whatnot, they can mix and match and play it exactly how they want. The notion of listening to things in a specific order is kind of out the window again these are all part and parcel of like so many of these same problems and again i don't know where it goes but it's uh we're old <laughs> i mean i do skip the uh arrival at moss Eisley every time we arrive uh if that's in any way relevant why why do you skip it you just uh just because and the wretched hive of scum and villainy 
There are two farting Jawas. Yeah. No, I know. By the way, not, this is, uh, you know, now to get all Star Wars nerdy, and this is the part that I'm sure bothers everybody connected to the Star Wars, whatever. My biggest problem with those special editions, I mean, besides the fact that it's all unnecessary, is I don't think it's a good match. You know, the expensiveness of the ILM, you know, everything that they can do, anything and everything. Yeah. To me, all of that special effects stuff that they did just sort of jumps out at you like a sore thumb. In a bad just way. Does, yeah, it doesn't look it doesn't look like it was done. Whereas I guess when you go into like Raiders and they kind of over the years, you know, they took out the reflection. Remember that extra reflection that but, that's not I, what I I'm talking I know, about. But that's a complete, I know, but it's a seamless fix that yes. doesn't ruin the scene. Yes, I, I guess removing matte I'm going lines with it. Yeah. and, you know, fixing, right. you know, fixing right. jumpies, you know, if there's a smoothing that can be done, sure. Nobody's going to begrudge you that. That's not what people are talking about, and to and to and and to, you know, to make it about that is to be obscuring the conversation to be a contrarian. No, I agree. That's not what the we're talking about. The digital Millennium Falcon, you know, whatever taking off to me, it doesn't look right in a movie that is full of models. And, and again, look, maybe yeah. if you had built a model and done a model taking off, maybe that might have looked like something. I don't think it's necessary. But the larger point here is. It doesn't look like the rest of it. And to me, it takes away from the incredible yeah. model work of the movie yeah. by sort of going, here's this digital thing. The, um, the yeah. job of the hut sequence is yeah. the worst looking thing in the film. And yeah. it's the newest because yeah. it's now 25 years out of date CG that was done at the you know, bleeding edge of the technology when it was a nascent technology and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work and it's a bad scene. And that's why it was. So cut. what I'm hearing is we should just do new, new CGI version, make a, like a, a new, that's new right. special edition. That's right. Yeah. Triple down, extend yeah. the scene. Um, I want to hear, I want more conversation with Boba Fett. I want to find out more about him in that first movie before Han gets on the Millennium Falcon. Um, but this has been fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like we've, I feel like we we've done our little tight hour here. We've 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 come to the uh, we've come to the end. Unless unless you have anything else to add, no. I mean, I don't know what the ultimate it's conclusion a philo is. No, it is a philo it's a philosophical question, and I think we honestly were interested in raising the issue mm -hmm. more than solving it because I don't think you can solve it. I think everyone will need to sort of make decisions on their own. But it is fascinating to think about pop culture sort of arcs and you can think about it you can think about history that way i mean just think about like in america like what presidents people remember it's a, you know it's a fascinating yeah. thing like what presidents the average american can name and i don't yeah. think it's Bob Hope. just right i don't think it, ziggy president ziggy um i don't think it's just and C president crazy harry um i don't think it's just like oh they, like school's bad now i do think there is a an element of simply we don't remember them because it's like their accomplishments fall away. It's hard to remember when, I don't know, that when Texas wasn't part of the United States. Yeah. Therefore, ergo, it's hard to sort of think about James Polk. Uh, one of my favorite presidents. Um, so, you know, but you know what I mean? It's sort of like as the accomplishments fall away and that obviously, again, back to the icon sense, Lee Lincoln has become an icon. Like people may not know everything about Lincoln, but they know the look of Lincoln yeah. and the look of Washington and the look. And in some ways, everything is the tramp. And when you think about what that means, like the, the tramp, the Elvis, the Marilyn with the dress, these things yeah. become iconic. I think Star Wars has a couple of those icons. I think some of the other things we've been talking about have their own iconic element. And I do think those things last, but I do think the details fall away. And I do think some of these things will fall away more than we quite realize they will. And that'll, that'll be very just, interesting to see uh in the in the as when people uh excavate this uh podcast in the future in the year like four thousand million whatever i think they're going to be really because this is obviously going to be very important to future societies i think they're going to look back on we're this good for and, at least 80 yeah. years no but i'm talking like ten thousand years in the future oh, when, I see. when schools yeah. are studying this podcast yeah ten thousand years from now when bart gets married 
people are going to be listening to this and they're going to be like, oh my God, those guys raised some really interesting points. Here we are. Uh, isn't that right? Professor Chaplin, Professor Let's Clone. Let's go watch the Professor new, Cloned Chaplin. Let's go watch, new, watch the new Star Wars series on Disney Plus. On Disney um, Plus Plus, which is what it'll be called. That's right. In that, in that's right. Years, yeah. It's beamed right into your head. And uh, yeah, I mean, well, well said. Well said. I don't Dave. know what we'll, we said. We said something, well, but I think uh, you know it's a but, fascinating. Hey, if discussion. you're driving, you just filled an hour. Hopefully, you're at your That's destination. Right. Yeah. You're at you're at to work. <laughs> you're feeling better or worse about your recent. Purchases. You can go to sleep now. You're in bed. You can go to sleep. Now. That's right. <laughs> We've lulled you to sleep. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. Um. Right. Yeah. So should we uh, should we play the game? Yes. What are we playing? I don't even know. The, the Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> I think so. Ooh. Right? Yeah. That is tough. I mean, which movie, first of all? And then, and then, I mean, I think it always comes back to Charlie's stuff, but um, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite? The, like, you know, it's funny. The, 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 I know the gold rush a bit. I know, uh, I, I know, uh, I know city lights a bit. I know the dictator a bit. I guess those are the ones I know. And then I know, I guess, I know pieces of others, you know, famous yeah. scenes from other ones. Yeah. Uh, like, or, you know, but I, I, times, I, yeah. yeah, I can't sit here and say to you, oh, that machine from modern times. Like, I remember it, but I, you know what I mean? Like, but I don't mm -hmm. necessarily know the whole movie. I saw it in a film class many, many years ago. And, you know, that's what I remember, you know. Uh, do you? I mean, do you think? Have you watched them unto yeah, themselves? I mean, or yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. did, I did a whole, I did a whole, like, the serious, stuff. like, I had this. I had this big hole in my, my silent film uh, world. So I went to the comedies cause I just, it was hard to, yeah. it, for me, it's very hard, but the dramas because it's, no, it's so, course, yeah. it's a different art form, but the comedies, they're still funny. <laughs> they really do stand up. You know, Charlie Chaplin is hilarious. And I went through this whole, this whole uh, Harry Lloyd, Buster Keaton, uh, Chaplin phase, but, um, uh, and I would actually say that I would probably say that Buster Keaton is my favorite of the three. Um, but Chaplin is undeniably iconic. Um, I, I, think yeah, I, mean, this is, I think it's well, city lights. I think it's city Here we'll get into some like, you know, like, what? How dare you? There's an intelligence to Chaplin. I'm sorry. There's an intelligence to Keaton, I think. Yes. I mean, that, I don't know, Chaplin often falls into, and again, it was of its time. He was playing for the cheap seats. Yeah. It, it, it definitely, you can feel the violin playing sometimes a little bit. Yeah. 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 Tugging at your heartstrings. And, and, that, and that's fine. Yeah. It's all and that's fine. absolutely fine. He knew, absolutely he knew what fine. he was yeah. doing. Yeah. There's a, um, by the way, there's an interesting story uh, that is in the, there's a Keaton documentary that uh, Peter Bogdanovich, uh, I think directed and also, I think also narrates, I believe that uh, I think shows up occasionally on TCM. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, TMC, sorry. <laughs> um, and what I anyway, where I was going about no, you had it right. TCM, Turner Classic Movies. Oh, oh right, the movie channel. Sorry, yeah, no, TCM. Yeah, you're right. Um, anyway, later in TMC life, TMC is the movie channel right, from the old days. Right, from yeah. the old days, that's that's yeah. how old I am. But uh, you know, back when Crazy Harry was making movies. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a story late in life of them meeting and I think doing some sort of a scene together, and it was sort of this interesting thing of like Keaton was funnier and Chaplin was really, really jealous, uh, which yeah. I thought was sort of interesting. Anyway, none of this matters. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to read that, that uh, Keaton biography that you were talking about. So if you, if you can send that to me offline. Yes, I will. Like I said, there's the two feed. of them. There was one recently was towards. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. There's one Great. that's like Keaton alone and there's one about like Keaton and his times. Anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, what do you take? I mean, I feel like, it, I mean, it, it feels like which piece of wardrobe are you taking from know. which, you know, which I'm sort of I mean, hat, hat or cane, hat or cane. Yeah. I know? mean, that's the thing. <laughs> that, that, that's, that, that's the, uh, that's, that's the, I think that's the, that's the question. Favorite movie minus city lights. I think, I think it's just his most interesting, dramatic, funny turn. It's not just pure sort of absurdist comedy. There's, there's a heart to it. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's, that's the one for me. Um, I think, I think, I think I'm hat guy, I think, but 
Yeah, I don't know. Could where, where... be a cane guy. I mean, it yeah. it feels like the perfect Chaplin display would be a hat with a cane under it. Yeah. I guess so. There right. you go. Somewhere in there is an answer. But look at us. All we've done is kind of default to the icons, which is to say, yep. you know, if something from those movies showed up and someone said, "Well, no, these are the pants belonging to so and so," I don't know. You know, I I don't, I don't think I'm that interested. You know, it's the same thing. By the way, sorry, I realize we're having the same discussion over and over again. You know, over the years. And again, I love Abbott and Costello and occasionally like uh, Abbott mm. and Costello costume pieces show up, you know, where it's like Bud's pants from blank or Lou's jockey, you know, where he dressed as a jockey in one of the horse racing movies. And I just, ew, you know what I mean? Like it just not, I, I don't care. And yet, and I'm still a fan and I don't care, you know? Yeah. I, what do I want? I want a, a Susquehanna hat that they've punched through from Susquehanna Hat Company. But I, I can't imagine that exists. And if it did exist, I don't know how you would authenticate it. But anyway, so I, I'm a fan, but I, I'm i not interested in, you know, so-and-so's shirt or, you know, so-and-so's tie. Anyway. Yeah. So, I don't know. Icons. That's uh, that's what we leave you with as you drift off Seek to the sleep. icons, yeah. people. Seek icons, icons from icons. icons. Yeah. And there you go. If you're not uh, well, asleep now driving, I don't know. Now you just, are. You just crashed. Yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, Dave. This was a great, uh, great little discussion. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, we'll return next week. Um, please join us then. In the meantime, uh, subscribe, rate us five stars, write a review. Uh, Follow us on us. social media at Props Podcast on all promote the us relevant on social media. Promote us. Well, yes, follow us. Promote us. Get 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 two friends just to like or subscribe, please. Just, <laughs> please, yeah, God. just steal <laughs> just steal your girlfriend's phone and subscribe to us on it. She'll never. She won't mind. She'll, she'll never she'll know. Literally, never know. Yeah. yeah, she might find something she likes. You never know. Um, and uh, write us at uh, dreams are made of podcast at gmail dot com. Send us your. Uh, questions, comments, what do you think of the uh, 80 years of pop culture uh, timeline and uh, and join us uh, join us next week where we will be getting into another fascinating topic here on The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. <laughs> <laughs>